Hi, I'm Rajneesh. And I'm Bridget. Welcome to Terra Science, the podcast where reality matters. This episode is a deep dive into the unique quantum consciousness theory called Ork OR, which was developed by Penrose and Stuart Hemeroff. We talk about the Ork OR theory and its unique features, which make consciousness accessible through these biological cytoskeletal structures, microtubules in the neurons. It was a really amazing conversation. If you've ever wondered what is consciousness, how this may all, all work in neurons in our brain, you do not want to miss this episode. It is an honor today to have Dr. Stuart Hameroff with us. Stuart is an anesthesiologist and uh, I've known him for a few years, met him in Arizona. And Stuart has been well known for his work in consciousness. Stuart uh, Hameroff and uh, Sir Roger Penrose uh, came up with the Orchestrated Objective Reduction Theory, ORC, O-R, uh, which suggests that consciousness relies on quantum states. And I think, at least in the last conference, the science of consciousness, uh, which uh, Dr. Hameroff organized, I thought there was good sport uh, starting to accumulate for the orc war theory. It was really exciting. And I came back uh, very excited and, and wanting to learn more. So um, uh, before taking more, more time, I would like to uh, get started. And maybe, uh, Stuart, you can tell us about yourself and the orc OR. Sure. Hi, Rajneesh. Hi, Bridget. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm an anesthesiologist. I went into uh, that profession after medical school primarily to study consciousness. Uh, I got an interest in consciousness as an undergrad, and uh, then in med school, was oriented towards uh, neurology, psychiatry, neuroscience, uh, uh, neurosurgery. Um, but I didn't; uh, the lifestyles didn't grab me, and I, I did a, a research elective in a cancer lab, studying mitosis, how cells divide and and the chromosomes are pulled apart by these uh, spindles called microtubules, which are microtubules and centrioles. And at that same time, in the early seventies. A couple other things happened. Uh, it was discovered that microtubules were in all cells because prior to that, the fixative agent for the electron mi microscope was dissolving them. And the inside of cells looked like a watery soup. But then when they changed, uh, I think from osmium tetroxide to glutaraldehyde or something like that, all of a sudden they saw all this structure inside cells, including neurons. So neurons were full of these microtubules and cytoskeletal structures, which had a, a grid-like uh, lattice, which reminded me of a computer because the early 70s was for me also the beginning of the computer era. And I was trying to you know, learn and figure them out about Boolean switching matrices. And it all came down to some kind of switching matrix and interactions. And of course, synapses in the brain were thought to be that, but I thought microtubules might be processing information at this basic level. And I got that idea that they were computers and I worked on that for, 20 years, going into anesthesia, studying how anesthesia worked, uh, saying there was all this information processing at a deeper level. And then one day after 20 years, somebody said, okay, let's say you're right. How would that explain consciousness? How would that explain feelings, love, joy, so-called heart problem, which came along later. And I had to admit they were, they were right. I, I really didn't know. I, uh, and they suggested I read a book by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind, which had a mechanism but needed a structure. So I did, and uh, here we are another uh, 30 years later. Wow. Well, I should say that, that what happened was that he and I teamed up and we developed a, a theory of quantum computations in microtubules inside neurons of the brain, which uh, underlie uh, brain activity. And uh, this was a controversial, controversial idea for a lot of reasons. People thought biology is too warm, wet, and noisy for uh, delicate quantum effects. Um, but that turned out not to be the case. Um, plants use quantum coherence and photosynthesis. I'm looking out at beautiful the mountains uh, and the and trees and plants, and and they're all using photosynthesis uh, to uh, to uh, take sunlight and convert it to chemical energy by a process that goes through a protein where the energy gets uh, uh, converted to uh, uh, coherent excitons, quantum uh, property, quantum particles or entities that go through seven different uh, 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 chromophores in superposition at the same time. And that quantum efficiency allows the sunlight to be converted to chemical energy that we eat and the, and the animals eat and so forth. So without that, there may not, may not be light and uh, may not be life nor consciousness. And uh, so if a plant can, can do it, I figure uh, the brain can do it. So 
it turns out the brain can't do it. Microtubules are really good at quantum coherence. So, so uh, you know, so I, I, I've been very interested in this. So to be honest, you know, I got attracted to this because um, also coming from sort of like an Indian background and uh, Vedic interests, uh, I've always felt that consciousness is like sort of a, a interaction that our brain is capable of doing with information that is outside. And if that information is at quantum level, I do not know of any other theory that really approaches that other than ORC OR. And it's really interesting that the ORC OR concept relies on this quantum randomness, which is um, unpredictable. But then, uh, as, as you and Saraja Pranos have said, there is a collapse. And this collapse uh, of, uh, of a state allows us to then, and that collapse may depend upon the conditions of, of you know genetics and physics or whatever role each instant an individual brain is going on and that then manifests itself into that conscious understanding so from randomness all of a sudden now you're able to be conscious and aware of what you are i think it's a beautiful theory and and it aligns really well uh, with uh, lots of concepts that have existed uh, since ancient times I know that. And uh, that's one of the reasons it attracted me to, to quantum mechanics as an explanation for consciousness when I first learned about it. I, I might comment on one thing you said. It, it appears random. The quantum, quantum activity appears random, but we don't really know. And in the collapse, in, in Roger's view of objective reduction, there's something he calls a non-computable effect. That uh, if it, maybe it's random, but then when the collapse occurs, there's some kind of a bias or tilt towards certain values, so certain perceptions, certain actions that he used to call platonic values. They could be, you know, uh, the way of the Tao or divine guidance or something in a spiritual realm, but he kind of shies away from that. But uh, it's actually the uh, the Schrodinger-Newton equation in his in his formulas. And uh, so those are two pretty good names to drop if you're going right. to have an equation. Yes. So, but but there's some, some sense that there may be platonic values that the collapse occurs to. Whether it's random before the collapse is another question. But... A quantum computation, you have multiple coexisting possibilities in quantum superposition. And then you're right, when collapse occurs or something happens, they pick definite ones. And many people think, thought, and still think that consciousness comes from the outside and causes collapse. Roger turned that around and said collapse occurs spontaneously and causes consciousness. So that was, that was the big deal. And, and so there was this recent report from uh, some research at Grand Sasso National Laboratory and I think uh, the suggestion was the role of gravity in this collapse. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was wondering, I don't know if gravity has been invoked that much anyway in causing the collapse, like you just said. Would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, well, it's quantum gravity. And Roger, Roger uh, got the idea. And, you know, in a general sense, you think of uh, gravity is very weak. But as you get more and more mass, there's more and more gravity. So there could be some level of increasing mass in superposition that reaches the threshold. But Roger actually looked at it in a different way. He said, he said that the mat matter, he, he went to general relativity, Einstein's general relativity, in which matter is curvature in space-time. Right. Usually right. for giant things like the sun, curving space-time so you can see the starlight behind the sun like Edding, Edding, uh, Eddington did in 1919. But also for tiny things, for quant uh, tiny particles, you can, tiny curvatures. So a superposition, a particle here, here and here, is a curvature here and a curvature here, a separation in space-time geometry in the, in the space-time continuum. And as that evolves and get bigger, you, you might imagine, at least I imagine, that if they were to continue, each forms their own universe and you have the many worlds hypothesis. Right. Mm -hmm. But Roger said these separations are unstable will, and will collapse to one or the other. And when that happens, there's a moment of at least proto-conscious experience, a bing of subjective phenomenal awareness. So that's the origin of consciousness in the universe from these self collapses and they're happening in this view everywhere in the random environment but uh, we call them proto conscious because they lack they're isolated they, they have no memory they come and they go they don't necessarily have any causal uh, action but there's this kind of blanket awareness mm -hmm. kind of like noise kind of like you go to the symphony and the instruments the musicians are tuning their instruments and you hear all this noise and cacophony mm -hmm. but then the, the symphony starts so the question is what makes the noise into the symphony that is consciousness and 
that's the microtubules. That's our idea anyway. I think, I think personally, I, I kind of want to slow down for a sec because coming from a background where I don't have really any understanding of quantum physics at all or, or what quantum randomness might mean, yeah. um, you were talking about like quantum activity and then the collapses and how those happen spontaneously. And I'm trying to, to understand what that means. Is this within each individual, as you're saying, or then there's the consciousness of the universe? And how do you differentiate, you know, where, where those collapses are occurring? Right. So sure. there's one equation, sense, yeah. one equation. Yeah. Uh, it's basically the uncertainty principle. And it says that these collapses are going to happen at time T equals H bar, which is a Planck's constant, uh, Planck Dirac constant, over E sub G, which is the amount of superposition. So E sub G could be anything. It could be an atom. Uh, it could be something larger. Um, but uh, if, it's, if, if it's an atom or an atom nucleus, if it goes in superposition, means it literally separates from itself. And what that means is that the space-time geometry separates. And when those separations get too large, rather than forming another universe, they collapse at time T, given by a simple equation. So a large superposition, large E sub G, will collapse very quickly. A small superposition will take a long time. So you have these happening at different, different time domains, different, different frequencies, and so forth. And uh, so what you want in the brain is a quantum superposition that's conveying information, quantum information. This is how quantum computers work. You know, so instead of having one or zero, you can have one and zero, quantum bit. And when you have enough of these that are entangled, uh, they, they, or somebody makes a measurement, they collapse, and each one or zero become, uh, uh, sorry, each one and zero. In superposition, they're one and zero, superposition. They collapse to one or zero, and that's the answer. So that's a quantum computation. Okay. And actually, that, that's a good question because that's, that's how uh, Sir Roger Penrose and uh, uh, Dr. Hameroff started working because uh, uh, Sir Roger Penrose were looking at what, what might be the location of this. And I think Stuart suggested uh, it was microtubules. So right. in each brain, each neuron, there are microtubules. Right. He 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 thought uh, that maybe it could be like a neuron firing and not firing. That superposition. That the cute. So you want the qubit, the quantum bit, where you have a, a one and zero that goes to one or zero. So it could be a neuron firing and not firing that goes to uh, firing or uh, firing or not firing. Uh, from and to or, and uh, but that's too big. Neurons too big already. It's going to get decoherence and so forth. But I had been studying microtubules for many years, and I thought he's looking for microtubules because I already knew that they had some quantum uh, coherence uh, from Froehlich coherence. So I suggested that to him, and he said, "Yeah, let's." You know, he he he, he caught on right away how uh, if they were really real. And first he thought they were simulations that I had made up or something. I said, "No, no, no. They're really in all cells." And particularly neurons, and so we went. He said, "Yeah," and he liked the uh, the Fibonacci geometry, the the uh, in the alpha uh, in the uh, A lattice that if you wind wind around the microtubule, uh, the it intersects on one column every uh, three, five, eight, thirteen. The, the Fibonacci geometry, which Roger likes geometry a lot. So um, anyway, we we started modeling microtubules as quantum computers. And after all these years, we now have uh, in, uh, evidence that, uh, number one, for quantum vibrations in uh, various frequency ranges from Anurban in India, uh, or in Japan, rather. He's from India, but he's working in Japan. In terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz, these periodic uh, uh, cell-similar patterns, uh, fractal-like uh, oscillations in microtubules that span scales from terahertz, which is visible, all the way to, to hertz, to EEG, every three orders of magnitude. And uh, we've been doing uh, experiments at Princeton as part of the Templeton study, looking at uh, 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 tryptophan fluorescence lifetime, quantum optical effects in microtubules. And, and these quantum uh, excitons propagate along the microtubule. And if you add an anesthetic, you block it. So that's, that's really big news. And uh, we're writing that paper up now. And then we have another similar study looking for a, a phenomenon called super radiance, which is another quantum effect in, mic in microtubules. That seems to also go away with anesthesia. So we think we're hot on the on the track of of, of finding a quantum uh, identifying this quantum mechanism or mechanisms in microtubules that go away with anesthesia and therefore are candidates for consciousness. And that, that that's a part that I'm really interested in. And you know, when you and I met, I, I was already interested in tryptophan pathway, 
which uh, is amazing because downstream of tryptophan are all the wonderful um, uh, molecules like dimethyltryptamine and uh, leading to serotonin and so we can we can draw some arrows in in a model where like you're suggesting that there is um, a, let's say a collapse of quantum information and whether quantum gravity is involved at that stage but ultimately the perception could be at these uh, uh, tryptophan nodes in the micro microtubules and then the uh, vibrations in the microtubules are transmitting or, or relaying that information uh, to manifest into consciousness. So the, this seems to be forming a nice model. Um, the, the question then arises, how do you, how do you test that? Because, uh, you know, the, the, the connection, the, the distance between the information and the molecular uh, objectification of that information, that's, that's the hard question. How, how, how can one address that? Right. Good question. Well, uh, you know, this theory has, is on multiple levels, so you can't do it all at once. So right now I'd say we're working on three different levels. Um, the, in the middle level would be the quantum optical effects, uh, looking at uh, uh, fluorescence and super radiance and quantum optical effects in microtubules at the level of individual microtubules and showing that they go away with anesthesia. And we want to next do those in the gas phase, uh, to show, so we have the microtubule in a little plexiglass chamber, you're bringing in air, and then you add uh, a vaporizer, so there's anesthetic in there, like the, the microtube is a little patient, and uh, instead of the patient losing consciousness, you look for the effect, you're, you're looking at the super radiance, or the quantum optical coherence, and if it goes away when the anesthesia is there, and then you, you uh, uh, blow off the anesthesia and it comes back, you can say, ah, it's reversible, just like anesthesia. And then you compare different anesthetic gases that have known potencies in putting you or I or an animal to sleep, and you see if the relative potencies in, in putting in and uh, dampening the uh, mic the microtubule quantum effect is the same as their potency in putting humans and animals to sleep. Then we will have a good argument that this is uh, a, if not the, mechanism of, of uh, anesthesia acting on consciousness. Right. So, so that's, that's, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that's the, the middle level, and maybe we should stay there for a while. But there's also how does this work in the brain? And there's, right. there's big news on that. Mm -hmm. And then going downward, there's uh, also there's the, the quantum gravity, because um, it, it's hard to go directly from the outside world in the brain into into uh, quantum gravity. And so it's just real. Uh, we've just realized in the last few years that there's this intermediate quantum optical effect which is how microtubules interact with their surroundings and within the neuron and within each other. And then you have this effect of uh, the electron clouds in the aromatic rings. You mentioned uh, tryptophan. And uh, as you know, uh, organic rings like benzene rings and, and indole rings, which have high electron resonance clouds of elect delocalized electrons that are you know, uh, physical objects that are purely quantum, that uh, they, they couple with others and form these quantum oscillations. And all the, all the psychedelics and all the psychoactive uh, neurotransmitters you mentioned have these aromatic ranks. So I don't think that's a coincidence. And uh, uh, I, I think eventually it's all going to come down to what they do to the frequency of oscillations in microtubules, which will affect other things. Right. And go, going back to the middle level, uh, where you were talking about the uh, uh, role of anesthesia and uh, in uh, altering uh, the state of consciousness. And th that's something that, you know, I've been interested in. We've been working with Dr. Bruce McIver at uh, Stanford University. And uh, we, we thought early on, I'm a plant scientist, so my favorite subjects are plants. <laughs> so I thought, well, if all life is similar and if these processes are, uh, are, are the same, conserved, then we should be able to study how anesthesia works in plants. So, uh, you know, Bruce and I have been working on this and we've, we've been getting some really uh, very interesting results which we're putting together uh, in a publication uh, very soon. But we can also see um, tra transient effects of anesthesia on plant behavior. Now, people have tried anesthesia on plants for many, many decades. Uh, but I think it's the first time where we are looking at different concentrations of anesthesia. And actually, we are able to, we have a, a green fluorescent uh, protein tagged tubulin. So we can look at in vivo uh, microtubules and how they are behaving. Uh, and we can put, for example, a leaf under a confocal microscope and start to look at how microtubules are behaving in response to anesthesia in vivo. So it's been really exciting. We have some images we just got last week, uh, which I shared with Bruce and I'll, I'll 
you know, uh, we're putting it together in publication, uh, but I'll also send copies to you. But I think we are finding support for the uh, range of anesthesia that, that is used in um, uh, surgery, for example, is the same range that is working in plants. Mm-hmm. And, the concentration. Yes, the concentration. Beautiful. And, that's, yeah, that's great. That's great. And and then the and they're able to recover with, with lower uh, concentrations. Plants are able to recover. Uh, we are we are still at the stage of trying to see if that effect is also in the microtubules. But we we visualizing we can see a huge effect on microtubule oh. polymerization. Assembly of microtubules is also affected uh, by anesthesia. Yeah, you know, there's some very old work from the '60s actually on uh, anesthetic on the uh, microtubules in a uh, echino uh, what is it e- echinospherium, this little tiny urchin which has these axonemes coming yeah. out. Right. And if you cut the axons, they're, they're, they're microtubules. They're a double helical spiral of microtubules. And if you give enough halothane, they depolymerize and, and, the, and they all just go away. And uh, But that turned out, in fact, that was one of the papers that got me interested in anesthesia. My, oh. my future chair at that time said he needed uh, residence desperately. He said, you know, I was interested in microtubules. He said, look at this. And I said, wow, they work on microtubules. But it turns out that happens at about five times the concentration. So I don't think... That I that when we put our patients to sleep, we depolymerize their microtubules. No. If we give too much, or over too many times, then uh, uh, we might, and that's bad because they can get this right. po- post-operative cognitive dysfunction, uh, very much like Alzheimer's disease, where the microtubules fall apart. So when you say that the microtubules depolymerize, I'm I'm I think that's great because it's showing an effect. But I'm hoping, well, I don't know, but and maybe plants are different that it's at a fairly high concentration. Well, so uh, also, you know, I, I think one of the differences in plants is uh, the microtubules function more like a cytoskeleton. They play a more cytoskeletal role. Uh, and so they are, so so the effect, they may be more sensitive to depolymerization in plants than in oh, neurons. Oh, that's how they, that's how they function. That's how they that's function. That's how they operate. I, I see. And then they repolymerize. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so so it's, it's this dynamics of, uh, of polymerization and depolymerization that is controlling, for example, stomatal opening, the guard cells. Uh, they have uh, polymerized microtubules and only then the stomata will open. And it's very essential because CO2 exchange and transpiration all occurs through stomata. So I, I think I think the, uh, the effect on microtubules might be at a different level. Uh, but, uh, the, so, but we will find out. That's why we need to do more research. Uh, and we are trying different concentrations. And if we can, uh, another interesting thing that we are finding is is uh, there there is a bit of a disconnect now. We are observing in stomatal opening and microtubule polymerization, which was not really that well studied or known before. So with anesthesia, we are exploring two different directions now. One is uh, functionality of microtubules uh, in the function in the roles that uh, leaves play, as well as what anesthesia can do. Uh, which has not been studied, so uh, it's 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 an exciting area, and, and things just opening up, and hopefully we can make some links. Another cool thing we can do is there are you know easy mutants. We can order up mutants in in uh, Arabidopsis uh, for different downstream uh, genes, or even for example tryptophan, uh, which may be you know less tryptophans or altered. We can. Uh, create certain mutations and then go in and study whether changing the tryptophan uh, reduces the sensitivity to anesthesia or but there, there's so many really cool stuff that we can actually start to study in plants yeah absolutely you know uh my friend dante loretta is an astronomer a planetary scientist who's looking for life uh on uh asteroid i think you might have met him at the conference i think Bring- I- sample and he's been looking at at uh, you know the origin of life and 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 tryptophan actually uh comes in well it's in plants uh, but in it if you go earlier to more basic it doesn't appear right away and he's trying to correlate that with some uh, uh some change in the in the uh in the universe and it not its atmosphere obvious in its conditions so some event uh, yeah pardon me mm. so some event yeah uh, right yeah. right uh, uh, some change in the oxygen or something, oh, in the, okay. yeah, in the atmosphere. So it's all going to tie together, hopefully, some someday. Yeah, and no, I think yeah. The, the quantum stuff and the tryptophan, the other aromatic rings, are going to be very important. Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's very interesting, and I, I, I think I, there is a connection because, like you mentioned, photosynthesis is already a really good example, where uh, you, you know systems have evolved to take uh, energy uh, from light 
and information from light and convert that into actual mass, which is sugar. So, so it's it's a it's a already a really good example. So I don't see why consciousness cannot be also a sim, similar process, where uh, there is uh, information and energy that then we are uh, our our systems are converting, utilizing such as microtubules in the neurons. Uh, what those um, perception mechanisms are and what the signal transduction pathways are is what we need to uh, focus on and try to uh, explore. But to me, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, uh, I mentioned the, the upper level. We should go back to the quantum gravity level later, but we've been talking about the, qu the quantum optic. But if you right. go up to the level of the brain, because I've been thinking for a while, okay, let's say Orko Art is right. How is it going to work in the brain? And how would you know the consciousness within any particular part of the brain? And um, I, I think, well, I won't go into it, but I think uh, a lot of it's happening in the pyramidal cell layers, uh, layer five uh, pyramidal cells in the cortex, because they're like the, uh, um, you know, percept the apex of the perception action cycle. Information comes in, the thalamus, and then back of the brain, front of the brain, and then gets broadcast. And then it goes to the pyramidal cells, and, and there axons go to the spinal cord for behavior. So you have this big this big uh, array of mixed polarity microtubules where they're going up and down next to each other and they're interrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, they're part of the cytoskeleton, but why are they interrupted? Is the, you wouldn't break your bones to, for a <laughs> But it it's probably has to do with the fact that they can uh, enable interference patterns uh, between them. If, if they're, and, and I think the interference patterns give rise to beats, like beat frequencies, yeah. like in music, slower and slower from like terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz, which is EEG. And we think even EEG is related to this as the, the slow end. And that and and uh, the point I was trying to get to is that um, it looks now that in, in the EEG are not just, you know, the hertz uh, up to, you know, 40 hertz or 100 hertz, but actually kilohertz, me megahertz, gigahertz, right. and terahertz. And Honor Bon in in Japan – has been finding this and he can now detect it at, he's been finding it in microtubules all along and now he's finding it in human EEG from the scalp with some special That's electrodes and uh, they, he just finished a big study and they're writing it up. So in the next year, I think we're going to be hearing a lot about this, ultra, I don't know what they're going to call it, ultra high frequency EEG in, in megahertz and gigahertz. And he's already shown that in a neural network, the megahertz and gigahertz and the microtubules control uh, synaptic fire or axonal firing in, uh, in in adjacent neurons, but also even distant neurons. So there's mm. some, this might be effaptic uh, conduction, you know, electromagnetic, or it could be quantum entanglement, but it's from microtubules at a very high frequency to microtubules in, a, in a, another neuron at, a, a, at the same high frequency communicating that way, as opposed to membrane conduction alone and synaptic conduction transmission, which is very slow. So this is a much faster and more efficient way of doing things. So which there's a high frequency yeah. thing. Which makes sense because so now, you know, we, we have made this connection between how a waveform, which is a quantum level, is now being tr carried on as a vibration through through almost like a microtube right. uh, down. And I, it makes uh, also invokes, I think, the role of epigenetics then. So so these these interconnecting uh, things that you're mentioning, perhaps there is uh, epigenetic information that might be, uh, uh, you know, encoded. And may maybe carried even carried uh, through generations as, as some people have have made those links there as well. Yeah, right. I think uh, there, there's some evidence in C. elegans that epigenetic information is in the centriole. So you know the, the centriole is the, uh, these two barrels of made of microtubules that when cell division occurs, each barrel replicates, and you have another two barrels, and they separate. And when when they replicate, they do this weird twisting thing so that every every one on one contacts the other. So they could actually transmit information of every tubulin in a centriole uh, to, the, to the daughter cell outside of the, the genetics. So at least in C. elegans and probably all, all cells, including ours, epigenetic information is in the centrioles and the cytoskeleton. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 all, it's all kind of coming together um, uh, in, in that sense. Sorry, Bridget, we got really deep into No, science. don't be sorry at all. <laughs> But I'm I'm trying to follow the best I can. It's great to meet a um, microtubule aficionado like Rashid. <laughs> no, let it flow. It's microtubule <laughs> fever. He got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I got That's it a long right. time ago. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, no microtubules. Uh, you know, I think that they they also like you were mentioning about tryptophan, 
microtubules also go w- w- all the way back uh, to ancient times. So, you know, if if we if we invoke consciousness into some some things that have to play a role, they have to be ancient, and and so the, the, this also links that uh, that way. Uh, well, let me ask you a question: Which came first, consciousness or life? Well, that's a. <laughs> We'll have to have a, a whole episode on that. I would say that <laughs> I would say that uh, consciousness is our ability to know that we are alive. Uh, maybe. So, so, I was. That's, I'm, that's like, kind of. That's more like self consciousness. Self consciousness. Right. Go, go right. ahead, Bridget. You were. Great. Well, I was. That was kind of on my mind. Where I was. I was going to ask: Is is your when you're talking about consciousness and how the microtubules are are related? Are you considering consciousness as that awareness of the thing of your reactions and how you respond to the environment, or are you um, referring to just the ability for cells to react? Not that we're necessarily aware of it, but that our bodies are able to react to the environment, and that's the consciousness. Uh, being able to react doesn't necessarily imply consciousness. Okay, and and you may not even need a body to have consciousness. I mean, if, if okay. consciousness of these self collapses, they're happening in the environment all, all the time. They happen in the air molecules. Mm-hmm. They're happening in, in the table. They're happening in my, you know, uh, coffee cup. Um, and but they would be there because the superpositions will meet another superposition and reach threshold and, and self collapse. But they're just isolated and and I won't say they lack meaning, but they they lack uh, context and memory and. And mm-hmm. and this sounds weird that this is happening all around us. But if you're a panpsychist and a lot of neuroscientists become panpsychists, you know, consciousness is attached to atoms or particles or something. So this isn't that weird. In fact, it's less weird because it's what gives rise to the states of those atoms and so forth. So uh, and as I said before, metaphorically, th- this proof of consciousness is like noise of a uh, orchestra warming up. So how does it, you know, begin to play Beethoven or Brahms or the Beatles or whatever? And uh, I think that's uh, the orchestration of the quantum superpositions by the microtubules. So work or. And I'm, I'm going to go back to answer that question correctly. I, I, in my opinion, I think consciousness precedes life, uh, and mainly because I think life is uh, has a, a form or was was formed to experience what consciousness had to offer to put it simply <laughs> we can we can go into many details because i so one of the reasons that it was always confusing me to me and i had to distinguish a consciousness which we experience as self consciousness from consciousness what deepak chopra would call universal consciousness so i gave it a name call i call it aleph and the reason i call it aleph is because i think or I had to separate it from information that is sort of like uh, a stem cell. So consciousness or Aleph in my mind is like a stem cell that can create anything. Once it commits to creating something, whether it's going to be a living form or a non-living form, then it's going to have an experience uh, bound or limited by its own properties. So So I separated those two types of consciousness. But I believe in, or I think... I believe is a very strong word, but I would say that I uh, I feel in myself also that I'm experiencing something that's greater than me and that life is a consequence of some information or some knowledge that existed prior to life. What would you say? I would say that um, consciousness, uh, the proto-consciousness has been around all the time, or at least before before life. Then we had the primordial soup or something like that, where you had a simmering mix of biomolecules, a uh, simmering mix which included uh, uh, amphipathic biomolecules, which are aromatic on one end and then polar on the other, like a, like a tryptophan or a, or a dopamine. So uh, they're gonna, the, the nonpolar groups are going to coalesce like a soap molecule and be in the middle, and the polar tails are going to stick out, and they form micelles, according to Operin and Haldane. The origin of life story, uh, but you have all these aromatic rings that are that are at the at the Van der Waals radius, and they're going to start to couple and oscillate, and they're going to form a qu- collective quantum state. And if they, if that gets big enough, they're going to reach threshold and have a collapse and have a moment of conscious experience, some of which could be pleasurable. So I think what happened is uh, in the or it, it, many 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 places, many many primordial soups that these these my cells started to have. Uh, 
pleasurable moments, which gave a feedback fitness function to self-organize to optimize the pleasure. Because if you look at any any lab experiment, any animal or human for that matter, it's driven by behavior, which is almost always to seek pleasure, avoid displeasure, right? So I think even going back to the primordial soup, there are these primitive uh, pleasurable moments, which were the feedback fitness function for cells, for these uh, my cells to organize, leading to multi uh, cells, multicellular organism. And I think that still continues today. I think evolution uh, all the way through has been driven in one way or another by pleasure, not necessarily strictly hedonistic, but altruistic, spiritual, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't have to be, you know. Yes, I, I, I also hold the same view. And you described the physical process that that makes a lot of sense to me, too, as well with the uh, polar and aromatic amino acids. So I would just add another angle to that. Um, so what if, and I, I, this is something that I'm interested in, what if the, uh, the, pr the, the, the primordial consciousness or, or the consciousness prior to that, what if there was a guiding factor? So, you know, there, there's this, this discussion about survival of the fittest and the theory of evolution and whether, whether there was some guidance uh, in, for example, symbiosis. Uh, you know, a, a prokaryote coming into and forming chloroplasts or mitochondria. So it's it's not then the survival of the fittest individual, it's the survival of the uh, uh, symbiotic uh, organisms coming together. So do you think that that it's 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 not only simply that evolution of uh, the pleasure aspect, but there's also a sort of uh, sort of like a some sort of uh, guidance or or assemblage assemblage that uh, uh, moves the system more towards pleasurable moments? Well, I think, I, I think uh, th there could be uh, some, uh, some global uh, entity of, um, you know, in the universe with, uh, that, that's, that could be the platonic values embedded in the fine scale structure of the universe yeah. that we're moving, to, moving towards. But um, uh, I, I think... Uh, you know, uh, symbiosis and other cooperative activities that that uh, are essential for for evolution might be to uh, again optimize pleasure. I mean, right. uh, yeah. for example, one one symbiotic thing that uh, Margulis uh, Sagan uh, uh, talked about, but then dropped, was the spirochete coming into the prokaryotic cell. The spirochete was had this flagella, okay, and uh, these spirochetes were swimming around while these prokaryotes were pretty immobile and uh the the spirochete invaded the the mitochondria were there and the core other things but um the spirochetes you know left behind their microtubules and they were used to uh, compartmentalize inside that cell so they could have cell division they could flow they could move they could do intelligent things so that's a, that's a symbiotic uh event that I think is the most essential that gave rise to eukaryotic cell. Unfortunately, as, as, as happens sometimes in science, Margulis Sagan had it, uh, was discouraged from, from saying that, uh, because, uh, a bacteria have something, uh, more primitive cells have, uh, have something, uh, that preceded tubulin, an F, F, T, F, S, T, Z protein or, and, and so they say, well, tubulin is just an adaptation of that. Well, where the, you know, what was the purpose of the F, S, T, Z protein? So, uh, she kind of got it beaten out of her, like Libet got a lot of his stuff beaten out of him by the, unfortunately, by the uh, powers that be in science. And um, um, anyway, I think I, I think you know that could have that that symbiotic event of bringing the cytoskeleton is going to increase intelligence and adaptation, but also pleasure. And uh, I don't, um, it just I, I think we need to bring feelings into evolution because evolutionary theory. Has no, there's no consciousness. There's no feelings. I mean, Darwin wrote about it, but he never really included it in anything. It's all, and I think you know the worst idea ever is uh, the selfish gene idea that it's all about promoting the genes. Genes, to, unless genes feel and 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 give a crap about stuff, they're not. You know, what's the point? So I think I think we need feelings in evolution. Yeah, and that that, that links to pleasure. Yeah, yeah. pleasure is the, the dominant feeling. Right. But, right. But, <laughs> even yeah. even if it's like. Hunger. When you eat, you feel pleasurable, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? So hunger is displeasure. So avoidance of displeasure. Oh well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, I guess on maybe I, I hope this is still on the same same kind of a topic, but I'm very interested in things like meditation and mindfulness and how that relates to consciousness as well. And 
I don't know, is there um, types of research done on the effects of meditation per se on microtubules and how that might might change or affect the their processes? Uh, good question. Uh, I, I don't know offhand, although years ago there was a study, uh, the, the Dalai Lama sent his best uh, meditating monks to uh, Wisconsin to a EEG lab, uh, Davidson, mm-hmm. Richard Davidson's lab. And they found that these monks, when they meditated, had incredibly fast EEG. They were like, uh, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, in the, uh, uh, 180 uh, hertz or something like that, which back then was a record. Now, now it's, we know if we go deeper, we get, but they, they were faster than baseline. And even when they didn't meditate, they were faster. So mm-hmm. there's some kind of chronic change. And then when they meditated, they were even faster. So I think, the whole system, if you go to a, it's kind of like photons. If you go to a higher frequency, you get higher intensity consciousness and also more conscious mom- moments per second, which tends to slow down mm-hmm. your perception of, of the outside world. So, mm-hmm. and, but I think this whole EEG is going to, uh, is going to change when um, we find out more about the megahertz and gigahertz uh, oscillations inside neurons. That's, that's going to be a real paradigm. Yeah. And we, and we will have Jay Sanguinetti. Uh, on on the podcast and sometime soon. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Research, yeah. you know, it, uh, Jay is big on, on ultrasound, and uh, we we we've been working on that. Too. And I, I've always thought the ultrasound affects the microtubules in the brain, and and uh, and there's a lot of pushback from other people in the field. But but that's why I got interested in brain ultrasound originally uh, uh, about ten years ago, actually, because Anurban had discovered mega uh, again gigahertz. Uh, terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz. And of those, megahertz, I, I really wasn't interested in electromagnetic energy, microwaves, or anything like that. But megahertz was ultrasound, which I, I knew a lot about as an anesthesiologist. We use it all the time. It's safe. I actually tried it on myself uh, to prove that it, it didn't hurt, which it didn't. And uh, so we did a, the first study on humans in, in 2013 and showing an enhanced mood. And Jay and Shinzen Young have shown uh, uh, ultrasound focus to I think it's, I'm not sure the brain area, posterior cingulate cortex, maybe it causes mindfulness that enhances mindfulness. So they've done a lot of great work on that and uh, 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 inducing spiritual states or meditative states through uh, 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 ultrasound, particularly brain areas. And I think it's by resonating the microtubules, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which, which remains to be, you know, which we'll find as we make those connections. I think so. Right. I hope so. Right. Yeah, we want to do those experiments too. The quantum gravity, which Bridget, I'm sorry, sounds sounds uh, really boring, but it's actually, I think, pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, no, it doesn't sound boring at all. <laughs> okay, well, we we came under attack from these these uh, this group funded by the FQXI Fundamental Questions mm-hmm. Institute, and here's the paper. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it's too small, probably. This is uh, at the crossroad of the well, crossroad of the search for spontaneous radiation and the Oracle War consciousness. Theory. But then FQXI put out a, a press release that co- that summarized this in its pre- previous paper, collapsing a leading theory of the quantum mortgage, origin of consciousness, suggesting in the headline that they had debunked us, that they had refuted us. When actually what they did was they they uh, they did. Let me back up. Uh, quantum gravity uh, objective reduction that Roger Penrose developed, which includes consciousness. So it turns out he developed it in the late '80s that. Uh, there was a Hungarian guy, Diasi, who had originated a very similar idea, quantum gravity related, and uh, the collapse would occur at the exact, according to the exact same formula, T equals H bar over E sub G. I mentioned that earlier. Same formula. Uh, there were some, uh, and so when Roger found out about it, uh, it was it was in Hungary, and he didn't know. He, he started calling the 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 two theories the same. D, a DP theory, Diasi, Diasi Penrose objection reduction theory. So, um, but there are some differences. For example, um, uh, Diasi OR predicts that there's, there'll be measurable radiation with every collapse. And Roger says, no, there's no radiation. Uh, Diasi uh, OR is based on uh, dynamical Newtonian mathematics, uh, materialistic. Roger bases it on space time curvature, the structure of the universe, general relativity. So it's relativistic. And most importantly, uh, Roger's OR has a moment of consciousness and Diasi does not. Diasi OR does not. 
So uh, you can't measure consciousness, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. So anyway, they, they did the, the Diasi and his collaborators. So Diasi is part of this team. Did a study uh, looking for uh, radiation uh, that would be expected for quantum, uh, quantum gravity-related collapse uh, under a mountain in Italy to get away from the cosmic rays and stuff like that. And uh, they ran the experiment for two months, and they found no radiation. So that went completely against the Aussie and completely in favor of Roger. Um, but uh, they, when they wrote up the papers, they they didn't even they kind of hedged around the lack of radiation and said there must be something wrong here because there must be radiation. They didn't even consider Roger's objective reduction because he didn't put it in the terms that they could understand. So um, <clears throat> they figured there must be something wrong with how. The, so they figured out. They, they went to a very basic idea, which we did also in our earlier work, of what is what does it mean to be in superposition and at what level? So in our view, it was the level of the uh, atomic nuclei in the carbons. So if you look at a protein like tubulin, you can say, okay, it's in two states at once. Does that mean that the whole protein is separated from itself, the level of protein? That would be partial separation, and uh, it could be that. And it could be that they're separated at the level of all their atomic nuclei, or it could be that they're uh, separated at the level of the protons and neutrons inside the nuclei. So we actually did the math back in uh, the 90s. Actually, Roger gave me the formulas, and he said, you do the math, which I did. With great, with, it was great pleasure because, you know, uh, it was something different for me. To do. I hadn't, you know, done anything like that in a while. But it was a bunch of algebra, and I figured it out, and he checked it. And uh, we figured out that the uh, – the, the dominant effect was in the atomic nuclei, which meant that the superposition, so if you have a, a carbon atom uh, and, you know, it's got its electrons around it, and then it's going to be in a ring, but, but we'll, we'll wait on that. Um, what is in superposition? Well, what's in superposition, just the nucleus is separated from itself. So it's liter literally behind, beside itself. It goes from being uh, 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 one to, to, to separating from itself, basically side. And that gave enough E sub G to self-collapse in a reasonable time, and our numbers worked out very nicely. So, um, okay, so then these guys do these experiments. They don't find the radiation. And they said, well, there must be something wrong. Let's mess around with this, uh, this uh, fudge factor, the smear factor. They actually call it that, of how something is separated from itself. And they determined that the, the more the separation, uh, the lower the radiation. And if you separate it far enough, there would be no radiation. So they said, well, we didn't see radiation. Therefore, this smear factor must be not the nucleus uh, next to each other, but separated by almost an angstrom, which is four or five orders of magnitude bigger. And at that point, you don't see radiation. And so that, then they took that value. They put it plugged it into our formula, and they got numbers that made no sense at all. So they totally screwed up our, our, our beautiful, I think, formula, which worked beautifully. And uh, with their own, and tried to make an ORC OR out of Diazi OR instead of Penrose OR, which doesn't make any sense at all. That's the basis for them saying they refuted our model. It's the biggest bunch of horse shit I ever heard. Uh, and I've heard a lot. <laughs> I say that, but it is. And, and I, I've been in communication with the very nice people. We're going we're gonna to meet at a conference next month. But um, Roger and I are writing a, uh, a rebuttal a press release. And uh, so stay tuned to that. Oh yeah, I, mean, Great. I, I Great. look yeah. forward to it. You know, and I, I understand enough um, of the quantum system uh, uh, and physics to get myself into trouble. But I, I do understand enough to, to try to apply into functional biology, and a lot of this uh, has to do with that. And so, in my very simplistic view, I think the the quantum uh, randomness or or uh, uh, incoherence, uh, the the collapse ultimately. Uh, I also believe in the, uh, I think the ORC OR version, which is the curvature based one rather than the DRC, uh, because that does make it makes a connection to the universe. Excuse me for interrupting. That's, yeah. that's so that's so cool. Yeah, I, I really like, and, and if we if we put that into function, uh, and and looking at quantum gravity, which we don't even know whether it even exists. I mean, let's let's start with that first. Uh, it, it's a hypothesis at the moment, and so um, so the radiation part which is an output. And like you're saying, when the distance is angstrom uh, length, whether there is radiation or not, I don't think that that uh, goes in any way to prove or disprove uh, any of it. So so uh, the way you explain it to me, uh, it seems like um, the, 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 the process of um, studying it 
uh, was based on a hypothetical, uh, uh, you know, a system, which which we don't know whether it is true or not to begin with. And then the outread was to show that that hypothetical system may not function. So I, I don't think it even touches the the equation or or the hypothesis. They, did, they didn't even actually make an accusation. They just kind right. of made innuendos. They disproved their own theory, and then by you know tarring with the same brush, they claim to disprove ours. But here's the irony of this. Um, uh, Roger, uh, uh, they wrote to him, they didn't write to me, to, and he didn't write back, but he's been working on an idea that he actually presented at the, at the last couple of Tucson conferences about retroactivity, where, yes. he, talks about, where he talks about the, the superposition and the collapse. And uh, so what happens to the unselected curvature? Right. Okay. And this is, I think this is also called the tails problem, the quantum mechanics, right. if, because uh, that that would would cause the radiation. So he he realized that what ha, what, what happens is with each collapse, there's this activity retroactivity goes backward in time and erases the unselected curvature and erases the radiation. Right. The radiation might have happened, but it right. got erased. So who cares? Or it, it didn't happen. So it's a beautiful way of making this consciousness thing uh, uh, almost uh, self perpetuating. You know, right. it, it doesn't need energy. Because well, it's, it's, it's yeah, or it's KT, or it's 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 whatever's out there. It's driving these uh, superposition separations collapses, and then you get rid of the uh, of the unselected, so you don't have an energy loss. Right. So it just keeps rolling along. So I think it's a beautiful thing. I think these guys, if they had known about this, they would have realized they were right in the first place, but that it got got erased. So this whole thing is is very interesting fiasco. Yes. Well, I, I'm looking forward to uh, you, uh, you know, the, the article that you'll be writing and to solving the fiasco. Uh, very soon. Yeah, thank you. So Absolutely. great. Well, uh, also, uh, uh, there'll be the Science of Consciousness conference again, uh, I think in mm -hmm. 2024. Yeah, we're going to have uh, have one next year in uh, in 23 in Sicily, Italy, put on by uh, Ricardo Manzotti and his friends. And it's going to be in a a place called Tormina on Sicily, which I've been to, is a beautiful place. It's on the, uh, it's it's by Mount Etna, which is an active volcano. So there's all this kind of rumbling going on, and it's right by the sea with beautiful beaches, wow. ancient Greek and uh, Roman uh, uh, amphi um, amphitheater that they're going to let us use for the poetry slam, and uh, they're going all out. They got a beautiful uh, indoor uh, venue too, and uh, great beaches, great restaurants, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And then well, back. Let's put some plants or, or you know, some other stuff in there so I can also come. To oh, it. you got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And then back in uh, 24, we sh we'll be back in Tucson. Okay, great. Yeah. And uh, so we'll put all those links uh, to mm -hmm. the conference uh, uh, in, in, the, a, in the description. Yeah. There's a donation link to the, the conference as well that we'll include. Thank well, you. great. This has been a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. And I know we got a little bit too deep into science, science, but uh, it was fun. <laughs> it was. Thank you both. Yeah. I really appreciate you know meeting you, Stuart, and hearing about all of this, even though it's sometimes a little bit out of my depths. But I think I've, I feel like I've learned a lot more just, just through this conversation as well. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Bridget and Rajneesh. And uh, maybe you'll catch microtubule fever too pretty soon. Yeah, <laughs> or some of our listeners might too. So yeah, yeah. if you're if you're listening, please uh, give us a like and subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. You've been watching Terra Science, the podcast where reality matters. We discuss food, planet, consciousness, the issues that we face, and the solutions that can be offered. And we discuss with uh, wonderful guests who are leading the way in finding these solutions. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell.